Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 566. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's show, we're going to talk about Uber, Lyft, and Pinterest. Is it time to buy? This article comes to us from CNBC.com and was written by Ari Levy, and he called it Uber, Lyft, and Pinterest prove that private investors are sucking up all the value. And so I saw this article, I read it, I liked what they said, and I wanted to share this perspective with you and add a little bit of my own as well. So Ari has three bullet points here, three key points. It says, it's been a rough two years for consumer IPOs. That's initial public offerings from Snap in 2017 to Uber and Lyft this year. Second key point, private market investors are generating all the returns, which is exactly what the experts have predicted for years. Third key point, enterprise IPOs have performed much better, but even business software companies are starting to stay private longer. And the article says, nobody in Silicon Valley should be surprised by Uber's disappointing IPO or Lyft's. Experts have been predicting this type of performance for years. Mark Andreessen called the effective death of the IPO in 2014 and said that with high-flying tech companies staying private longer, gains from the growth accrue to the private investor, not the public investor. Fred Wilson of Union Square Ventures told CNBC, the following year that these late stage IPOs mean all of the gains are captured among a very small cohort of people. In 2016, Alex Mittal of Funders Club wrote that today's top tech companies are raising gobs of private cash, leaving the bulk of returns out of public investors reach. In other words, It's the private investors that got in early to invest in these companies that are cashing out when the companies go public and sell those shares in an IPO to you, the retail investor. The article goes on to say, these are the very people that benefit from companies who stay private longer while their valuations skyrocket because they're the early investors. They get to ride the valuation up from the millions to 10 billion $20 billion or $50 billion, and then sell their shares to the masses of public market investors who are thirsting for the next Amazon or Google. They were the ones warning us about the emerging Uber Lyft problem, and they were right. Over the last two plus years, public investors have gotten consumer brands with big names, but few gains. Snap has lost about one third of its value since its 2017 IPO, while Dropbox and Spotify are up just slightly from their debuts last year. Uber and Lyft have dropped. After falling 13% on Friday on a bad earnings report, Pinterest is back to where it was trading in its first few days in April. Maybe we made a mistake in having these unicorns sucking in huge amounts of private capital and delaying their IPOs, said Duncan Davidson, a partner at venture firm Bullpen Capital, in an interview this week. Maybe we'd be better off having these puppies go public earlier like we used to. And by the way, I just want to pause and say unicorns are companies worth $1 billion that go public. So it's not a common occurrence, at least it didn't used to be. But now this year, it has been a common occurrence because venture capitalists have been waiting longer and therefore the valuations have gotten a lot bigger before they've decided to take it to the public market. Yes, they are waiting an awful lot longer to take these companies public, but these valuations of $100 billion are just insane. I mean, how could a software company that's really a taxi cab service be worth $100 billion? Now, maybe it's got all kinds of R&D that's going to do all kinds of fancy self-driving cars or other up-and-coming technology, 
But that's all in the future, and that is not guaranteed. It's high risk, it's definitely not certain, and you're pricing in everything happening to perfection to the maximum best opportunity it possibly could be in order to get to that kind of evaluation. It's simply crazy and outrageous that companies are being priced at these levels. These are ridiculous valuations of companies. And one of the things that I talked about in a prior podcast before the IPOs was just how ridiculous those valuations were. So priced to perfection years in advance that it had no bearing on reality today. And so those companies have nothing to do but to decline to get back to somewhere in a realistic valuation And these three companies are still overvalued, in my opinion. So I think we're still too early in the process, even though we've seen some pretty significant pullbacks in these companies, it's still too early to even think about buying. The article goes on to say, a good chunk of the capital at the later stage has come from firms like T. Rowe Price and Fidelity, who normally buy public stocks but moved into the private markets in recent years so as not to miss out on all the value creation. Since they're already shareholders, it's hard to get them to buy more when it's time to take the company public. A lot of the prime public investors you'd want in your stock after the IPO already own the stock, says Iris Choi, a partner at early stage venture firm Floodgate, who previously worked in investment banking at Goldman Sachs. What is their incentive to actually buy at the IPO? Of course, it's still too soon to come to any conclusions about where Uber, Lyft, and others will be trading months or years down the line. Well, I just did. Investors can point to Facebook's miserable kickoff in May 2012 and the fact that it lost half its value over the next three months before rebounding. Now shareholders who bought in at the IPO and held have seen their investments quintuple. There was plenty of skepticism surrounding Google's lofty valuation in 2004, but buy-in holders are up 2,800%. However, if you're banking on a similar result from this new class, consider two important factors. Facebook and Google are outliers, and they were profitable at the time of their IPOs. With the latest crop of consumer offerings, public investors are being asked to pick up where the venture community left off and continue to subsidize cash-burning growth while the companies seek to prove they can morph into sustainable long-term businesses. Investors are balking. The big lesson everybody in Silicon Valley learned is unit economics really do matter, Davidson said. So what happens from here? There's still little pressure for startups to change their approach because private capital is so plentiful. SoftBank's Vision Fund, which has poured billions into Uber, WeWork, and other capital-heavy businesses, is only planning to get bigger. Venture fundraising hit a record $55.5 billion last year, according to the National Venture Capital Association, and those firms have to put their capital to work. In the first quarter of 2019, five mega funds, meaning over $500 million, closed, the NVCA said, and more prominent firms are in the process of raising $1 billion or more. These funds are increasingly willing to put some of their cash into secondaries, buying shares from founders who can lock in a portion of their riches while steering clear of quarterly earnings and the scrutiny of public markets. Mega funds are creating challenges with the oversupply of capital, and it's reducing discipline in operating companies, said Robert Mittendorf, who invests in health tech companies at Norwest Venture Partners. We forget out here that operating results are more important than the amount of capital raised. We should be applauding operating performance more. It's certainly not all gloom and doom. Enterprise software companies continue to reward public investors. Video conferencing company Zoom, which is profitable, has more than doubled from its IPO price in April and has even generated substantial gains for investors who missed the initial pop. PagerDuty has also more than doubled, and Fastly, whose technology helps companies more quickly deliver online content, surged 50% in its debut on Friday. Smaller enterprise companies have had even more success since going public. In January, venture capitalist Jeff Richards of GGV wrote on LinkedIn that 14 of the 20 best-performing tech IPOs since 2014 were worth less than $1 billion at the time of their offering. Almost all of them sell to businesses. 
But Dan Skolnick of Trinity Ventures says things are rapidly changing. The late stage investors who previously concentrated their dollars in consumer companies have caught on to the enterprise where cloud software, developer tools, and collaboration technologies are seeing huge adoption and have increasingly predictable revenue models. Skolnick, who invests primarily in business software and infrastructure startups, points to companies like Snowflake Computing, HashiCorp, and Confluent, which all have raised money at valuations in the billions of dollars. His firm is an investor in data backup startup Cohesity, backed by SoftBank and valued last year at over $1 billion. The private markets for consumer funding developed and got frothy long before enterprise was considered investing, Skolnick said. Now that the enterprise is caught up, for public market investors, it's not going to get any better, he said. It's probably going to get worse because the system is a wash in capital. End of article. So basically, just to summarize, I think we've seen these IPO prices being priced much, much too richly to be able to sustain themselves. And until they pull back to an area that is more into reality, we haven't seen an area that I would consider buying any of these recent IPOs. The nice thing is you don't have to buy when a company goes public, you can buy it later after watching it and waiting until it does have profits. There's no sense buying a stock that's losing money when there's so many companies out there that are very profitable and making a lot of money. Those would be my pick for an investment are profitable companies who have earnings rising at a rising rate. It's getting more profitable. And that's the kind of company you want to look for. Companies that are making a lot of money, companies that might be undervalued from what the market is pricing them at, but that have tremendous opportunities for future growth into much higher valuations. But when these companies come out and they're already priced at extremely rich valuations, there's just nowhere for the companies to go. Lots of times there can be a lot of publicity and hype and exposure that gets everybody all excited about these companies. But you really have to look at what are they worth and what are they being valued at? Because oftentimes there can be a huge gap difference between the two and they should be valued much lower than what the investment bankers are pricing them at. So be careful not to get caught into these traps of overvaluation and the hype that is happening out there. So I thought this article explained what was going on pretty well, and I'm going to put a link to it in the show notes and on my website so you can take a look if you want to look it over. I also want to remind you that this podcast is different from other podcasts in that this is wealth mentoring. So most of the episodes on my podcast are evergreen titles. That means they are actual teaching and learning. And therefore, you can go back and look for some topics that you want to know. Some of the things that relate to what we've talked about today that I would recommend you listen to would be podcast number 47 called What Makes Stocks Go Up? That is one of my classic episodes that talks about how to find winning stocks in the stock market. Another one would be podcast number 236 when I talked about Snapchat and I called it Snapchat Buyers Beware. Also podcast number 529 when I addressed these IPOs for 2019. It's called IPOs in 2019. And podcast number 235 which is when should I sell my stocks? So those are all related podcasts you might want to listen to. Again, number 47, 236, 529, and 235. And don't forget, iTunes only gives you the latest 300 podcasts. To go back to number 47, you have to go to my website to get that at lindapjones.com forward slash podcasts. And if you haven't yet subscribed to Be Wealthy and Smart, hit the subscribe button and you'll be updated as soon as new podcasts are available. Also, I wanted to let you know that the Wealth Heiress book sold out last week, but if you weren't able to get a copy, go ahead back to Amazon and sign up because we've got new copies coming in and I want you to be at the head of the line to get those as soon as they're back in stock. That's all for today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. 
Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.